continue going through this gospel in action. We just simply remind you, and by the way, while you're turning, let me say, if you have not on this in this section over here had the opportunity to fill in the clipboard, there's a clipboard sitting right there. We will need all hands on deck. We've some of our most faithful people who serve in this function of caring for folks in times of grief are are out. They're they're gone. They're they're traveling. Uh, they're ill, and we need uh, everybody to step up, all hands on deck, to help in some way, shape, or form. While you're turning there, though, let me let me say the gospel in action. We we've given it that overall title, the Gospel of Mark, because. Mark uses action words. He uses time-sensitive words immediately. Next, then. He's, he's moving, and you can tell this, he's writing Peter's memoirs, and he's moving us to the cross. And we find ourselves now in, in Mark chapter 12, in, the, uh, in verses 18 to 27, in this last week, Passion Week, as Jesus makes his way to Calvary. I appreciate so much the music that we've sung today at it speaks to the heart of Jesus and the, and the pressing of Jesus to come and finish that work that the Father gave him to do. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 to 27. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we've, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, but I really prefer for you to have your own Bible. So if you don't have one, you need one, see us after the service. We'll put one in your hands. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, as we read. From God's Word. You follow along as I read this text. Jesus answers a question about the resurrection. And the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection, and they ask him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, and really the idea is there's no, no male child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the bush how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord press upon us for many reasons today the glorious reality of the resurrection and let us celebrate that wherever we are in the journey. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week that as Jesus draws closer and closer to the cross, the religious leaders become increasingly intent on trapping him in some tricky question and using his words against him to discredit him. In fact, next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at the, someone approaching him, asking him, what's the, what's the most important commandment? It's just, it's just wave after wave. And you would think they would learn their lesson. Every tricking, tricky question becomes an opportunity for Jesus to teach a powerful transformational truth. In the portion of Mark we're reading today, Jesus is approached by this group of Sadducees who attempt to confuse Jesus with a ridiculous question regarding the resurrection, a reality that they themselves don't even believe occurs. Here's the irony. We read it responsively together. They're approaching someone who only a few days earlier, if you put the chronology together, only a few days earlier had raised a man from the dead, Lazarus at Bethany and had declared himself to be the resurrection and the life. I'll simply remind you, we read the passage, but John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
So I want us to see this passage just under, under four headings today for a few moments. First, there's the Sadducees, Leveret marriage, and the resurrection, verses 18 to 23. Second, Jesus answers their question with a question about their ignorance, verse 24. And Jesus teaches experientially about the resurrected life, verse 25. And then Jesus cites scripture to assert the reality of the resurrection, verses 26 and 27. These Sadducees, look at number one there. This, when they approach him, they're talking to him about leveret marriage. Just look at this passage. It's, the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. They ask him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. It's the idea behind this is that, that a man would want to have a male child who would carry on his name, his, his legacy. They put a whole lot of stock uh, that life in the blood, life in the flow of, of, of procreation, of, of regenerating life, so that a man would leave and, and, and a man was looked upon in that society as, uh, as blessed or not blessed based upon whether or not he had sons uh, who would, would follow him. And that's what they're talking about here. Let me give this ridiculous narrative, this, this story that I thought early on in my ministry, I thought they just made this out of thin air. But no, there's actually in, in the apocryphal book of Tobit, there's a story like this. So these fellows appeal to the apocrypha about these seven brothers. The first one took a wife, he died, left no offspring, left, left no male heir. The second took her, he died, leaving no offspring. The third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. All seven married her, all seven died. I mean, it was just parenthetically, you would think somewhere along the way someone would have asked the question, what is it about being married to this woman that is so deadly? She dies ultimately. And so they put a question to him about a matter that they don't even themselves believe occurs. It's, it is the height of hypocrisy. These Sadducees, you've got to know a little bit about them. Now, it's, it's kind of something at a loss to find out how, what their background is, how they, how they developed. We do know this about them that they were a group of religious leaders who were, who were opposed to the Pharisees. The Sadducees focused all their energy on the Torah, on the, on the first five books of the Bible, the, the Old Testament books of law. That's where they put all their stock in trade. They didn't take a whole lot of stock in the, in the historical books or the, or the Psalms or the prophets. It was about the law. I keep that in mind. It's going to be critical when they continue to encounter Jesus here. And they denied the resurrection. Uh, if you, to get a, I told you the Pharisees would be like our modern day fundamentalists. Very conservative. Very, uh, very suspicious. Very, very mean-spirited. Uh, fundamentalists with a capital F. It, and that was your Pharisees. If it didn't line up with them. didn't come out of them. They, weren't, they didn't trust it. The Sadducees were more like the liberals. They questioned a lot of things. They, they easily discounted uh, books of the Old Testament that were commonly regarded as, uh, as being authentic. In fact, there's a writing, an external writing from, from the writings of the Sanhedrin, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, that's directed this specifically against the Sadducees. Whoever says that the resurrection of the dead cannot be deduced from the Torah, the law, has no part in the age to come. The writings of the Sanhedrin said if you embrace the notion that there's no resurrection, then you have no part in the age to come, which wouldn't have bothered them too much. They didn't believe in a resurrection. But it was, it was, a, it was a denouncement upon them. And so they appeal to the law of leveret marriage. Look, I want you to see this real quickly in Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10, where this is, where this is introduced and if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the firstborn and the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. All right, now that's the principle. 
your brother takes a wife and your brother dies before, before there is a male heir left to him, then the law of leveret marriage said that then you as a brother will do the brotherly thing and go to the woman and take her as your wife uh, and treat her in a, in a wifely way and, and hopefully she will conceive and have a son and, and then the son will become, as he grows, the head of the household and he will carry on the name of the household. And if the man, verse 7, if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, now, so this is the widow. My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. So she makes her appeal to the elders. And the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of this man's house shall be called in Israel the house of him who has his sandal pulled off. And when you read that, You can see how seriously Israel took this idea of, of prolonging the name of a man's house with a male heir. They're appealing to this. And of course the, the point is that they've given Jesus this impossible situation and then said in the resurrection, they know that Jesus teaches that the resurrection is true, and so they think they've got him on the horns of a dilemma. So, so, so this, this fellow and his brothers and this woman, when they're resurrected, whose wife is she? With it implied, if there is such thing as a resurrection, isn't this something of a dilemma in that resurrection? Well, Jesus answers their question with a question about their ignorance. It's fascinating how Jesus was able to cut through the nonsense. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Now, I've told you before that when you're reading through the Gospels, one of the most offensive things you could say to them, in fact, the common person would never, it would never have occurred to the common person to say, to suggest to a Pharisee, to a scribe, to a Sadducee, to a Herodian, to a member of the Sanhedrin, you know, the reason you're wrong is that you're ignorant about the Scriptures. This is a bold statement Jesus makes. And I would su suggest to you that though he's been doing it from the beginning of his ministry, that the closer he gets to the cross, the more openly uh, emboldened he is to call them out and to expose their ignorance. But he, he says there's two things here, though. You know, neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. In other words, what he's saying is if you understood the power of God, then an idea like the resurrection would not be difficult for you to swallow. And you simply go back to the Psalms, and of course, again, the Sadducees didn't put much stock in the Psalms, but the Psalms of David, where David says in Psalm 23, a long time before there's a discussion on the idea of resurrection, when he comes to the end of that psalm, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Our, our English versions say forever, but really when you read it in the Hebrew, I will dwell in the house of the Lord for a length of days. Now, days upon days upon days. Days unnumbered, days following days into eon. That's the belief of all who know Jesus Christ. Now you say, no, but what's, what's the, that's obvious, Pastor. Not so obvious to all. Years ago, I was uh, pastoring in another, another town and a young man who was pastoring down the road, uh, working on his doctorate at, at the seminary in New Orleans, and uh, 
some folks had come to me and said that they were in attendance at a service he preached where he decided he was going to show folks why he was able to love the Bible more now that he was honest enough to admit that the Bible had errors in it. And one of the things he pointed out was that there's no resurrection. No return of Jesus. No resurrection. It really all is important is that we just live with the resurrected Jesus in our hearts. And this troubled some of our young men and women who had heard this at a, at a revival, set of revival services in the area. So I contacted him to talk to him to make sure that they, I don't, I don't take lightly when someone says something ill of a minister, because having been on the receiving end of that myself through the years, I, I, I don't take that lightly. I wanted to find out, have, have they represented him properly? Because if they hadn't, I wanted to sit down with our folks and say, you misunderstood him, what he meant to say. So I sat down with him. And they had not misunderstood him. He did not believe in the resurrection. And it was shocking to actually sit face to face with a young man who otherwise would have seemed fairly intelligent. But he was one of those fellows whose, whose education had outstripped, whose knowledge had outstripped his wisdom. You see, there's no way that a person can have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ unless they embrace him as having lived, having died, and having been raised from the dead. So Jesus says, you, you, isn't this why you're wrong? You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. They're, they're denying the power of God. Now they would have been shocked to hear this because they would have spoken uh, of, the, of the mighty demonstrations of God, the demonstrations of God on Sinai. They were, they were all about the law and the and the Exodus narrative where God gave the law at Sinai and the powerful demonstration, the powerful demonstration of God leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, they would have been all over that and asserting that, but they did not, they did not carry it into the future. It had no place. The power of God in their theology had no place beyond this life. And when it came to dying, when it came to the grave, that was, that was it. So, they're obviously hypocrites because they're asking Jesus about something that they themselves don't believe and they are uh, ignorant of God's power and God's word. And so, with that challenge to them, which they did not expect, again, they came to Jesus thinking, this, this, will get, this is going to be on the horns of a dilemma. He's going to be embarrassed here to try to tie this together. Jesus points out, and then says, let me tell you about the resurrected life. It says in verse 25, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. He's not suggesting there that we become angels. He's talking about how we enjoy heaven in, an, in a relational arrangement that right now we cannot imagine. Think with me a minute. How much bliss is there in heaven? So much so that a marriage relationship would, would be a limiting factor on experiencing the pure joy and bliss in heaven. It's hard for some people to take. You know, our brother Charlie has just said so long for now to his wife of 64 years. 64 years. And Jesus would say to him and would say to all of us in the resurrection which is coming. You have a relationship that will so far surpass what you had on this earth that marriage would be a hindrance to it. In our glorified bodies face to face with Jesus Christ worshiping Him adoring Him Every day growing, if you can even speak of days in heaven, every day growing increasingly in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of the glory of the Trinity, understanding increasingly the, 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 the power of the gospel, the preciousness of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for us. To be, to be fixed and focused on that, to be totally selfless, to be, to be completely unselfish and, and, and otherworldly. 
Jesus says part of your part of your problem is you want to take what's happening on earth and put it in heaven and that's folks we've got to learn this I hear people say things and, and I, I know they I know they they mean well folks some of the things we enjoy here on earth and we think well sure that'll be there in heaven you know? Jesus is in heaven God is in heaven I'll know my mother when we get there but I'll know her as as a sister a glorified sister in Christ and we'll worship him together unfettered Jesus teaches that heaven is superior to earthly relationships Paul said in Ephesians that when he talks about the marriage of a husband and a wife, he says, this is a mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. In other words, the relationship on earth foreshadows the relationship that, that Christ, the husband, will have with the church, his bride, in the, the ultimate consummation of the age. And we need to think more heavenly, don't we? We don't need to, to spend our time trying to transport experiences in earth into heaven. We need to spend more time praying for heaven to come down upon us here. Jesus prayed for unity. We ought to labor for that. That they may be one, Father, as you and I are one. Jesus said, I want them to be with me where you're taking me. And we ought to long for that. Joshua mentioned the things that have gone on this past week that have really been intense. And Lord willing, next week I will preach to this in some fashion as we look at the greatest commandment, to, to love the Lord your God with all of your being and to love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to look at that a little bit in, that, in those lenses. But see, folks, what we're dealing with is a sin problem. It's a sin problem. And the answer to the sin problem is a Savior. And we must show the way. We must light the way. We must be the ones. We must be the ones who bear with it. We must be the ones who, who, who practice a, a color blindedness to see sinners who have not yet come to Christ as people like we were at one point. We once were without Christ. And the sinner's greatest need is Christ. And to see those who have come to Christ who may be different from us culturally and, and ethnically and, and in many other ways, even politically, to see them as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and that the common experience of grace we have with Jesus Christ is greater than any differences we might marshal to show how different we are. That's what the church is called to do and to be and Jesus chides these religious leaders, these, these otherwise brilliant religious leaders because their knowledge has not issued forth in divine wisdom. And therefore their knowledge is not only not useful, it is harmful. And we should long as we grow more like Jesus and pray for wisdom from on high. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God doesn't resent us asking, Oh Lord, we need wisdom for the days in which we live. We need to learn to live. Increasingly to live as men and women and boys and girls who are bought by the blood of Christ, if indeed we are. The Sadducees were mistaken about the character of the resurrection life. But Jesus goes on, not having simply talked about a reality in heaven that he himself has experienced because he came from heaven. He knows what he's talking about there. But also he takes their own scripture. This is fascinating here. Look at, he cites the scripture to assert the reality of the resurrection, verses 26 and 27. And as for the dead being raised, he says, have you not read, again, you want to insult a Pharisee? You want to insult a Sadducee? You want to insult a Herodian, a, a scribe? You want to insult a Sanhedrin? Have you not read in the scriptures? You're not, you're not familiar with the scripture. 
If you've not read in the book of Moses, notice how he zeroes in on their preference of Old Testament writings. In the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not God of the dead, but of the living. You're quite wrong. Isn't it fascinating? These folks who had spent a good portion of their adult life pouring over the Torah, over the law, and memorizing it and, and applying it to life had missed the very name of God, the covenant name of God. We've been looking at these names of God on Wednesday night as we're, as we're praying and, and Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, if you're looking for the English spelling, Yahweh. It's, it, it derives from the Hebrew verb Hayah, which is the verb of being. And Hebrew allows for some movement in its tenses. So when you, when you speak of the verb of being, it, it can mean I am, I was, I will be. Depending on the context. And God takes that verb and reveals himself at the burning bush, Exodus 3, verse 6, if you want to look there. God said to Moses as he watched this bush burn and not be consumed, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. I am. I am, I was, I will be. You see, the very name of God. And this, this, this configuration occurs over and over. I just want to point out a couple of these to you just, just real quickly. Look at Exodus 3, 15 and 16. God also said to Moses, he's commissioning Moses to go and speak on behalf of the people to, to Pharaoh. Say to this people of Israel, the Lord the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. Then again in Exodus chapter 4 verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Brothers and sisters, Jesus ultimate dismantling of the Sadducees is to quote from the very section of the Old Testament that they revered as infallible, as authoritative, as applicable to teaching about life. And they missed the force. I am the God of Abraham. See, Abraham is dead. In the, in the Sadducees' mind, Isaac, dead, buried. Jacob, dead, buried. Jesus would use this in John's gospel. In the I am passages, I would encourage you to just get your concordance out and study those sometime. I am. He offended the, uh, the Pharisees in John's gospel, chapter 8, I think it is, where uh, he talked about that before Abraham was, I am. He, now, the Greek, different from Hebrew, the Greek is very tense specific. And what he's saying there is before Abraham existed, I existed. I pre-existed Abraham. And if Abraham were your father, he says to them, then you would believe me. Where Abraham was, I am. Jesus takes this description that God gives to Moses at the burning bush and takes it upon himself. Which is why, by the way, when he says to, to Martha, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Martha responds, you are the Christ, the Son of God. As anyone will respond when they come face to face with the reality that God sent His eternal Son, His beloved Son, who had existed for all of eternity, the second person of the Trinity. In the fullness of time, He came, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem us from the curse of the law. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And, and as he grew up, he became a more of a polarizing figure. Because he claimed that he had come from God. He claimed he came to do the will of God. He claimed that he and God had a unique relationship that no one had ever had before. And that the only way to have a right relationship with God was through him. That no one could come to the Father except through him. And it was either true or they were the words of a lunatic or a liar. You see, we have no option here. We don't get to say, well, you know, I, I appreciate Jesus' life and his teachings and all. No, no, no. If you don't embrace him as the I am, you imply that he lied. That he was a lunatic. He was, he was a fanatic. He didn't know what he was talking about. It's only as we come to Jesus Christ as the I am the eternal one who has the words of life, who went, as we sang in that, the, the song about the Apostles' Creed, that he died and rose again. And the early Christians said, I believe in the resurrection. That was their hope. Folks, it is the hope today of Christians all over the world. I promise you, as we meet today, Christians in India will be martyred, and their hope is that their death is not the end of it. That's the word the, Pharise the, the Sadducees would have had for them. Well, he had a good life. It was a good run. No, their hope is that death is not the end of it, but that death for the Christian simply is the vehicle that takes us from this life to the life which is to come. Paul says in Corinthians, if in this life only we have hope, we are the most, we should be the most pitied people and will be the most miserable people on the planet if, if all there is in life is what we experience now. He's wrestling with this in 1 Corinthians 15, and he says, but Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. And he has become the first fruits of those who've died. That's how critical it is. Sometimes we un unwittingly, unintentionally, we speak a lot of the cross, the cross, and folks never minimize the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is where he took our place. But it's, folks, it's the cross and resurrection. It's the cross and resurrection. He died for our redemption. He was raised for our justification. That by faith in a resurrected Savior, we could be made right with God. Jesus exposes them. That they don't even believe. Here's the that they don't even believe the portion of Scripture that they would have said was absolutely infallible. They don't understand it. They, they're wrong. They don't know the scriptures or the power of God. I asked the question of you today. What about you? Do you know the scriptures? Do you know the power of God in the gospel? I didn't ask you if you made a decision. But lots of folks make decisions. I want to ask you have, you, have you experienced the saving, transforming power of a resurrected Savior? So transforming that the scripture uses terms like coming from death to life, from darkness to light, from birth to new birth, from bondage to freedom. All these images used of a radical transformation that comes to all who are truly saved by grace through faith in Christ. You see, Paul goes on. He understands that the resurrection is the linchpin. If there is no resurrection, then there is no hope. Are we living as people who believe in the resurrection? 
Are we living a life that Peter says that, that by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and that applied to us by grace through faith that we've been made partakers of the divine nature, Peter says. Are we living a resurrected life? Or are we living a defeated life? Paul finishes out 1 Corinthians 15 with a passage that I read every time I stand at the graveside of a believer who has died in Jesus. I will read it, Lord willing, tomorrow at Norman Lee Ward's graveside. But Paul didn't write it to be read at funerals any more than he wrote 1 Corinthians 13 to be read at weddings. He wrote this to give hope. Listen to him. Listen to him. And ask yourself the question, have I been raised to life by grace through faith in Christ? He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. He's talking about believers here. But some, some believers will die, and Jesus will come for them, just like, just like on Friday. Normally passed from the land of the dying to the land of the living. Jesus came for her. We will not all sleep, though. He will come for some who are alive and remain until his coming is appearing. We will all be changed. Finally, ultimately, the change has been going on since we were saved by grace through faith, justified, declared not guilty, and accepted as righteous in His sight, beginning the journey of sanctification where we're, we're being delivered slowly but surely from the, from the power of sin in our lives. That one day, the ultimate change, the final change will happen when we will be made just like Him. Glorification. In justification, remember, we are, we are delivered from the penalty of sin. In sanctification, we are being delivered from the power of sin. In glorification, we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. We will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then Paul mocks death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, Where's your sting? See, here's the... For those who die in the Lord, they feel no sting. We feel it because we remain. But they feel no sting. Jesus took the stinger out of death when He died on the cross and raised, was raised from the dead three days later. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus exposed the Sadducees of their error that day. And we need to find out if we have such an error in us. Maybe, maybe, not, maybe not in thought, but perhaps in practice. Do we, do, we, do we live as resurrected ones? Do we live as people who are being sanctified, going from glory to glory, from, who, who are conquering uh, sin here and sin and growing in likeness of Christ, anticipating the day, longing for the day of the blessed hope when Jesus returns for us, either comes for us at death or comes for us at the consummation of the age. And if we are living that way, then Paul gives this final admonition. It's my admonition to you today, brothers and sisters. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Oh, brothers and sisters, we do some things that are vanity, that are foolish, but in the Lord, our labor for Christ is never in vain, never lost time, never lost energy. 
Jesus is coming. Again, he died and rose again. He ascended on high. He's at the right hand of the Father, ever living there to pray for his people, and he is coming again. And all you have to do is look around you and realize that time is drawing nearer and nearer. Are you ready for his coming? If you don't know him here today, you're not ready for his coming. And I plead with you, as death has invaded our congregation, I plead with you, today, be reconciled to Jesus Christ. Because you know not what tomorrow may bring. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, we come to you in Jesus' name, that sweet name, that powerful name. And we marvel at how the, the very best religion had to offer in his day would come to him wave after wave and find themselves exposed and stupefied in the face of such divine wisdom. And Lord, as we see that, we pray that we would not be found with attitudes like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, just religious people looking for a fight. But oh, that we would be found in love with Christ, loving Him for who He is, believing Him for what He taught, longing to be more like Him, longing for His return. Help us to have hope today that know that Jesus Christ's tomb stands empty as a reminder to us that in Christ, death holds no grip on us. He has conquered sin and death and hell and the grave. And in Him, we are more than conquerors because of His love. And so we, we pray today, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.